Okay, so I'll get uh, started. So this is uh, week five and another sunny day to good day to study about solar energy conversion. And so I'll, today I'll finish up on light trapping, just a uh, um, brief wrap up of that. And then we'll talk about this uh, topic of uh, multi-junction solar cells. And this would be followed by a lecture, a guest lecture on Wednesday by uh, uh, a speaker from uh, Solar Junction, Vijit, who is one of the founders of Solar Junction. And he'll come and uh, you know, expand on this uh, topic uh, more on Wednesday. <coughs> So this is something we were discussing in the last lecture. We were talking about uh, light trapping. And I mentioned to you there are two different techniques that uh, people employ. One is the use of this uh, anti-reflection coating that uh, helps in minimizing the reflection out of your top surface. And then the other one is the uh, use of this texturing or uh, texturing or roughening of the surface, which would essentially increase the path length. So when your light is incident, it would bounce it off in such an angle such that the total path length of the light within the cell is uh, maximized. So these are the two different uh, techniques used. For the texturing part of it, the goal of this texturing is to really create a uh, create an optical system such that when light is incident and it goes inside the cell, it completely forgets where it uh, came from. So the gold standard for that, which uh, people always use to compare these light trapping scenes, is uh, what is called as a Lombardian or Lombardian surface. And uh, the way this is defined, uh, what do you mean? So you know, if you read up uh, any textbooks on uh, light trapping or papers on light trapping, they'll always compare this scheme. You can pull up a table. So they'll compare this uh, scheme to a Lombardian surface. So they'll say, how good is their light trapping scheme as compared to the Lombardian surface? So what does this uh, this Lombardian surface mean? So what it means is that usually when you have a light coming in, it uh, reflects off uh, this uh, surface. And the intensity of the light, essentially, it will have some dependence upon the angle uh, at which uh, it uh, reflects at. So this Lombardian surface, it has this uh, dependence such that if it reflects off at an angle theta from the surface, the intensity of the light is proportional to cos theta. And uh, so you can see over here when it's uh, incident, uh, when it's reflecting back at uh, zero degree from the normal, it has a maximum intensity. As this angle increases, the intensity which is uh, indicated by the length of this arrow is uh, decreasing. And when it's uh, reflecting off at 90 degree, it has essentially zero intensity. So you see this uh, intensity, uh, it's following this uh, cos theta dependence. So the importance of uh, this cos theta dependence can uh, be understood. Uh, so can, does anybody know why, why this cos theta uh, dependence makes it a good Lamarckian surface? So that can be understood uh, from this uh, figure over here. So now my intensity essentially it has this cos theta dependence when I'm at an angle theta from uh, away from the surface, my intensity is reduced by cos theta. Now think about a person who's observing this light at the same angle. So think about of a person who's observing this uh, plane or you know who's ob looking at this light coming from the surface at an angle theta again from the normal. So if, if you're essentially standing over here and uh, looking at this surface from here, so let's say this is me over here, and I'm looking at this surface from uh, this oblique angle. So how much of the area of the surface will I see? So if I'm essentially standing at, uh, you know, at complete normal, I'll see that area A. But if I'm, I'm looking at that surface uh, from an oblique angle, I'll see this projected area, which is now a divided by cos theta. So you know, if you're, let's say I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm looking at this table, I look at it right from the top, I'll see an area A. 
But if I look at it at like grazing angle, I'll see a lot more of this surface area, right? So that area that I'll see would be essentially A divided by this cos theta. So now if my intensity, which is coming from the surface, it has this cos theta dependence. And the area that I'm seeing has this dependent, which is A by cos theta. The product of these two, that is the intensity multiplied by the projected area, uh, which is given by cos theta into A by cos theta. This would essentially be a constant, right? So if I have a light source, which, uh, uh, which uh, upon uh, reflection of light, it uh, gives back light in this cos theta dependent, then no matter what angle I look at the surface, I'll see the same intensity of the light. So this is what is called a Lambertian surface. So it's like you know when light came on this and when it got reflected, it completely forgot where it came from. So no matter where, whether you look at this source from a larger angle or you look at it from a normal angle, it would essentially appear to be of the same intensity. And that's what is called the Lambertian uh, surface. So all these light trapping schemes, they want to achieve this kind of uh, angular dependence where you have uh, this complete Lambertian surface, and when light comes in, and when it reflects back, it completely forgets where it came from. <coughs> so many people have tried to realize this, and you know they have tried to realize this uh, ideal light trapper, which essentially uh, reflects or you know which absorbs everything and reflects uh, nothing back. So one of the, again, gold standards to compare these uh, systems is uh, what is called a black silicon. This is not a very practical uh, structure for making a solar cell, but essentially it's a very highly textured surface. So you see over here that you know it has these uh, cones or these nanowires so that it's highly, uh, highly textured. So anything which is incident on, uh, on this uh, black silicon just completely gets absorbed within this layer and nothing is uh, reflected back. And uh, in, in, in reality, if you look at uh, you know, the surfaces of uh, solar cells, so you can tell how good of a good, uh, how good of an absorber it is by looking at the, you know, the color of the surface. If it's a really good light trapping scheme, you'll see that your solar cell will appear completely black. You know, if you'll, it will absorb all the wavelengths and uh, you'll uh, see that you know it's it's completely uh, uh, black to your eye and uh, so that's a you know a good quick way to tell how good a light trapping scheme you have uh, implemented many times these things appear blue because these are optimized to trap uh, uh, trap light at uh, the layer of the thickness of the silicon nitride and so on is optimized to trap light uh, at the green or uh, red wavelength, so you see that those are absorbed, and you see the surface to be uh, slightly bluish or bluish blackish in color. <coughs> right. So now we talked about silicon nitride uh, in the last lecture, uh, but I just want to mention that uh, uh, there has to be an optimal thickness of uh, silicon nitride. And you want to optimize that uh, thickness such that uh, it gives you the maximum uh, or it gives you the minimum reflectivity at a certain wavelength. And you want to optimize this thickness such that uh, this wavelength lies at the maximum point of your solar uh, spectrum. So let's say this is the intensity coming from my sun. So it has a wavelength dependence. And usually this peaks around a wavelength of uh, approximately 600. Uh, Okay, 600 uh, nanometer. This depends upon the temperature of the sun. Since sun is at 6,000 Kelvin, approximately the spectrum peaks somewhere between 500 to 600 nanometer. So now the, I mean, the way this anti-reflection coating works is that uh, it works on the principle of uh, destructive uh, interference. So you'll have reflection from the front surface, and then you'll have this reflection from the back surface. And if these two waves, uh, they interact uh, or they interfere destructively, then you'll have a minimum uh, reflectivity at uh, that particular wavelength. So if you have only one of these layers, so let's say you have only one silicon nitride layer, you can minimize this reflectivity for only one wavelength. And you would want to minimize it for the wavelength at which you have maximum intensity. Or you would want this minimum of this reflectivity 
to occur where the maximum of your uh, uh, of your solar irradiation uh, curve is. So usually these thicknesses are between uh, 80 to you know 150 nanometers, somewhere in that range, because you want uh, destructive interference. Guys, you guys can pull up a table. No, don't need to. Okay. Uh, seems like you know everybody sitting in a lounge. So. <laughs> So what we want is uh, two times, so let's say this thickness, the silicon nitride has a thickness uh, D. So two times D has to be equal to lambda by two for this destructive interference, so that this uh, wave which reflects from the front surface and the other waves which reflects from the back surface. So this uh, wave which reflects from the back surface, it travels a distance of 2D more and that has to be equal to lambda by 2, or this uh, thickness has to be approximately lambda by 4. So that's why this thickness of the silicon nitride layer are typically in this uh, range. So keep this uh, in the back of, you know, on the left, store it in your left part of your brain, because very soon we will look at uh, multi-junction cells, and we will see that how do you need to optimize this uh, silicon night or this anti-reflector coating for a multi-junction cell. And you see that everything that we have learned so far becomes uh, you know, much more complex or becomes four times more complex when we think about multi-junction cells. <coughs> so this is something also I described uh, in the last uh, lecture where uh, uh, by use of this uh, light trapping scheme, you could uh, use a much thinner material, so you could uh, use a material which is uh, in this case only 2 micron in thickness, but it can still absorb these uh, uh, higher wavelength light, so it can still absorb these red photons located uh, at uh, these higher wavelengths, because now using this anti-reflection coating and using this texturing, I have optimized or I have increased my path length uh, for these uh, red photons substantially and uh, they can get absorbed despite using a much lesser uh, much lesser amount of material okay <coughs> and as a result of that you could uh, obtain higher efficiencies at the same time you can reduce the thickness uh, of your cell and reducing the thickness of the cell is uh, is very important uh, not just because of reducing the uh, material cost of the semiconductor use, not just the material cost of silicon, but it also allows you to use a lower quality of silicon. And uh, that that is illustrated uh, in this uh, figure over here. So you have this trade-off, you always have this trade-off between the percentage of the light you can absorb, that is shown uh, in, the, in this red graph over here, as a function of the thickness. So if you increase your thickness, you will absorb higher and higher percentage of your light. So thickness, increasing the thickness plays well with absorbing the light. But what it doesn't play as well is uh, the percentage of the carrier that you can collect which are generated. So if you have a thick piece of uh, silicon, you will, a lot of your carriers which you will generate, they will just recombine before you can uh, collect them. And uh, the matrix that is used to uh, often define that is the diffusion length, which is uh, given by, which is related to the diffusion constant and the recombination time by this formula. So the higher the diffu diffusion length means higher is your uh, time before your carriers uh, recombine. So you see that uh, if you have a thick cell, you really need a very good quality material or you need a very high diffusion length, otherwise you will lose most of your carriers before they are recombined. So if you see that if you have this thicker cell, worse, but if you don't have good diffusion uh, length, so if you decrease your diffusion length, your efficiency accordingly will uh, decrease. So now this, uh, what the use of this light trapping scheme allows me to do is essentially it allows me to use a much uh, smaller piece of, uh, of semiconductor material. So instead of absorbing, instead of operating on this red curve, I now operate on uh, this red curve. And as a result of that, you see that uh, if I was here, the separation between these blue curves was quite large. But if I am over here, the separation between these blue curves is reduced. Or essentially the effect of my material quality or the effect of my uh, recombination time 
has uh, the effect of my lifetime of my carriers has reduced because I have less semiconductor material. I have a much thinner cell, so I can extract my carriers even with the same recombination time. I can ex still extract them before they recombine. So this is the main selling point, or you know, this is the main uh, crux of light trapping scheme. That uh, that even with a a low quality of silicon you can uh, and using a less amount of material you can perform better than a thicker film of uh, material and it uh, it reduces the emphasis of the quality of the material on uh, your cell so later so far we have studied these uh, schemes for uh, crystalline silicon but uh, uh, when we talk about uh, thin film silicon that would happen in week 6 and week 7 you see that the recombination times over there are uh, much lower, or the mobilities of the carrier, which is also reflective of the recombination time, are much lower. So these light trapping schemes are of even more significance when we talk about thin film uh, solar cells. And uh, so I'll bring this topic up uh, again when we talk about uh, about uh, thin film uh, technology. So I've, at the, what I do at the end of every module, I give some references which uh, those of you who are inclined or those of you who want to learn more or it was the material was not clear, they can uh, go back and look at it. And for the slide trapping thing, for crystalline silicon, I've uploaded two handouts uh, on the class website. I'll upload some more, I'll give you some more resources when we talk about light trapping uh, in thin film uh, solar cell. Okay? So any, any questions on this? Any questions? Uh, any doubts from uh, last class? Or so another thing which I should mention is that uh, your uh, uh, project details are out on the class website. And uh, go take a look. You have to form your teams by, I think, uh, May 3rd. And then the lab will be open for access from May 6th till uh, May 24th, right? May 24th. So uh, this is a time where you'll go to the lab and you know you can solder, play with these uh, uh, solar cells, make your module, try to you know, be creative. And the project, the aim of the project is really to get your hands dirty, have some fun using these cells. It's not a, it's not something where you know you you are like uh, you have a lot of anxiety about this project. It's really to have fun, learn about solar by actually looking at the cells, measuring their efficiency, making a module. And that's the best way to you know, learn about uh, this field. So do form uh, the teams. You can, do, you can form a team of uh, either, uh, you, know, you can do it uh, in a team of two or do it in a team of uh, three. And if you don't have a partner, I mean, you can look for them after this class, or you can go on the on the forum and also post that you know I know soldering. Does somebody else know something else? And you know maybe we would form a good team. Something like that. <coughs> and you, if you haven't learned soldering, if you haven't done soldering at a, since a long time, you'll probably learn it again in this project. Not too much of it, but just a little. 